so this is the fire in the desert with myself johnny and patrick how you going how's it going johnny pretty good thanks for having me andrew hawkins is a british national who learns about his ancestor sir john hawkins andrew's perspective was forever altered when he learned the truth about his ancestor i heard david plot from the life expedition speak in 2000 and he mentioned how hawkins was the first english slave trader it was a bit of a shock and it really challenged me particularly because Hawkins named his ship things like Jesus of Lubeck and the Grace of God. That really offended me, particularly the later name. God's grace had nothing to do with being chained up in the hold of a ship, lying in your own excrement for several months. So often things are done in the name of God that are horrific for mankind. I think God would consider what Sir John Hawkins did to be an abomination. It's quite shocking when you could think it was justifiable. Andrew says slavery was never justifiable, even in the 16th century, when people often say society didn't know any different. He says, we don't try to justify the Jewish Holocaust, but this was an African Holocaust. We have to face our history and our personal consequences. I went to show people that I didn't think what happened was right, and not everyone thought it was acceptable. Andrew and his fellow members from the Lifeline expedition made the apology at the International Roots Festival held in Gambia in June. This event, which runs for several weeks, encourages Africans to discover their ancestral identity. Um, so what we have here is uh, this guy in the, in the UK. He learns about himself, uh, that they had an ancestor, Sir John Hawkins, that was the, one of the first slave traders and decided to head back to um, Africa. So this is all reported by the BBC. It called an article, My Ancestors Traded in Human's Misery by Mario Cassiotolo. Yeah. I can pronounce that right. So um, you might see the picture there if you look up the article. So Andrew and 26 others from England, France, Germany, Jamaica, Barbados, Mali, Ivory Coast, and Sierra Leone all traveled to Gambia, noting black people came to apologize because black people sold black people to Europeans, Andrew said. They walk through the streets in yokes and chains and enter a stadium filled with 25,000 people with representatives all over Africa. They apologize in different languages unrehearsed. Andrew said, it's hard to remember what I said. I did say that as a member of the Hawkins family, I did not accept what had happened was right. I said the slave trade was an abomination to God and I had come to ask the African people for their forgiveness. So after all these um, these guys from all, all over Europe, as well as some of the, the West Indies, they, they march through the streets of uh, Gambia in, in chains, pretty much rep, you know mimicking the original uh, slaves. They apologize in all the languages, saying they're very sorry for the ancestors, for what they did was wrong. And then the vice president of Gambia, I can pronounce the name, Jair Saidi, joins them on the stage and then symbolically frees them from the chains. Yeah, gosh, it's, it's it is tricky to um, to break this down because on some level it seems almost a bit preposterous in some respects because you've got um, Andrew and obviously in this case twenty six other other men from from Europe going on this grand apology tour essentially and making this giant. Um, show how guilty they feel now i think that guilt that guilt that they're feeling is coming from somewhere and i think that's worth probably exploring or tapping into of why they feel guilty because again what, what one argument here is that what do they have to feel what do they have to feel guilty over they haven't actually done anything wrong but they are they're putting themselves into chains again mock chains metaphorical chains but they're putting themselves into chains and putting them themselves in this display of submission to other people, what does that actually achieve? I think that's that's one argument that's here. Well, it kind of reminds you of some kind of like self-flagellation, like they're whipping themselves to sort of atone for the pain or atone for the sins. Yeah, or going out in public wearing sackcloth or something, like yeah. what you see in the, well, is it, the Old, that, Testament, like, Old no, Testament stories or whatever. I'm trying to think, like, because of Game of Thrones, shame, the lady going, shame, shame. But... <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't actually, does it achieve anything? Like, has it actually righted the wrong? 
I mean, it, this is just one person, isn't it? Or these are few. These are few people. Well, the, I think I'd argue that the that it's we're not in a position where we can right the wrong because it was um, two hundred years ago. Yeah, that it's not. You're, he's not in a position to right the wrong, which is why I think it's it's less about solving a problem and more about assuaging his personal guilt that he's feeling over what's happened in the past. But I think that at some point you go. You, you have to stop and question you go mate you haven't actually done you haven't done anything wrong against the people you're seeking seeking an apology for mm. now it would be worth i think it would be worth uh asking the question the people in the crowd that he's apologizing to what is their reaction what are they feeling do they feel what what are they thinking yeah well and they were they actually descendants of slaves because they're here they're not in they're not in America or, or the UK. <laughs> Where did he actually tour to? He went. He went all over Africa, right? Yeah, he so did, well. They traveled to Gambia. Okay. And then they had they went to a stadium, and that stadium with twenty five thousand people had people from all over Africa. Yeah, yeah. But well, anyway, I think it, it's. It, I think this this particular story brings up several different issues or several different arguments here. One is that he's obviously he's obviously been held or convicted to take this rather dra- this extremely drastic action and seek the forgiveness and apology of people he feels that his ancestors have done wrong. Um, I think that it's a worthwhile argument to discuss and explore going, he hasn't personally done, done anything wrong against these people that he's apologizing for. Okay, so what are the people in the crowd, what's their response to mm. this? Because if they see, if I'd, I'd say if they feel that they've been personally grieved by the actions of his family, then sure. Then he's sought apology, he's found redemption and forgiveness, yeah. and hopefully the two groups can then reconcile and move on. Yeah. But if this, if if they look at it and go, why is this person doing this? Like he hasn't done anything against me. If that's the if that's the response, you go, okay, this is a this is him virtue signaling essentially. Mm. I sort of see it like these chains that they put on, it's like yeah. a symbolic of their historical guilt. Like yeah. this is something that sort of chains them back in history. And then this is something that is a old chain from like centuries ago. Mm. And then the president, uh, in order for them to be free, then they need to be freed by one of their people that belongs to the other side. So in this case, the pre- the vice president of Gambia, and he sort of symbolically frees them from their from their guilt and from the chains. Yeah, yeah. Is it be interesting to see what a psychologist would do or, or yeah. would, would analyze? Well, it's a it's it's a bit of a pantomime in some respects. It's it's this it's this um, over elaborate showy expression being put on public display. I, I think my comments would be very different if this was done either privately or semi-privately between this man who is a direct uh, descendant of someone involved in the slave trade and, say, the descendants of someone who has been directly impacted by slavery. Yeah. I think that then we'd be, ta- we'd be having a very different conversation, discussion, breaking the story down if that was the scenario we were looking at. Mm. But if it's just... If it's I as a white person I apologize to anyone who happens to be who have black skin, yeah. Then we, I think we're we're, bring, we're going into some to a different, um, which is obviously the conversation we're having now, where we're asking these questions. That's kind of the, where it it ends up going. Yeah, and it, and I'm not sure if you saw there's a there's a video that came out in February this year. It's called um, RSUPK White Couple Kisses Boots of Black Nationalists. Okay. No, I haven't heard. I haven't seen or heard of that one actually. So it actually happened in um, yeah in America, and it's um, the ISUPK. So it's actually the Israelite School of Universal Practical Knowledge. Okay. And it's classified as, by the Southern Law Poverty Center, which is an NGO, but yeah. more left leaning. Uh, so it's actually not. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, and they classify these uh, these groups as extremist, anti-white, anti-LGBT, and they want to have like a, a black segregation or they want to have a black nation within America. Right. Okay. This isn't the um, part of the same uh, Black Israelite group, or was it the Catholic school in the US? Uh, I'm not sure. This isn't the same group, is it? It might Coming be. To kids or something? I mean, if it's like Black Israelites, it usually refers to this kind of extremist groups. 
Yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry, I, I, I digress. Some. Well, like, you know, having your own nation sounds like, you know, Wakanda. Like, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Anyway, we, yeah. yeah. So it's actually reversing the efforts of, you know, you know Martin Luther King for, you know, the, yeah. he's pushed for desegregation. And then now these groups are saying that nah, the only way we can resolve all these um, historical grievances is by dividing ourselves back again. Yeah. Um, and if you actually watch the video, it starts off with a street preach, preacher by... Um, okay. Uh, one of these black uh, Israelites uh, preaching, and they yeah. have, like, next to them, on on each side of this this preacher is like you know two, two uh, you know I guess two pretty big guys. You know, I'm not sure thugs is the right word, but they, you know they have their arms crossed, they have you know bandanas, all kind of stuff, sunglasses, yeah. and he's preaching out there. And there's a there's a white couple that listens in on the street, and then he asks these couples to you know re, you know I guess atone for their guilt or historical guilt. For their sins, yeah. For their sins. And then the, he does it by, you know, asking him, the man, the man first, to kiss his boot. Okay. And then he goes, ah, you as well. So he also asks ask the, the girl to uh, kneel down and kiss the boot. Right. Then he gets them to kiss the boots of all, the, all of his group, including the cameraman as well. Right. Okay, then. And then later on, they ask them to, you know, make, you know, go around to the bank and make a donation, you know, follow this, you know, put it in this leaflet, um, whatever the, the codes are. So it, it's not, okay. so, you know, Hawkins example was, was a, a while ago, but we, this thing, this thing happens. This, it's still going on. This ha thing happens in America, you know, yeah. yeah, a couple months ago. Yeah. And I found it like, is a cringe factor to this video when I, when I watch this, like, it, okay. It's uncomfortable. I, I I haven't seen it yet, but um, to, it it would certainly be very uncomfortable and and confronting to watch anyone, regardless of their skin color, subjugate themselves that way. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. Is it what what are these guys seeking? Because the kissing the boot doesn't resolve the historical grievances. And no, I'd say it's it's a power play move. It's designed to humiliate the person and make them feel subservient to the person who is has power over you yeah that's what it is it, it's an exercise of power yeah oh there's there's so many theories out there you know one of the books i was reading is douglas murray's about you know the madness of crowds and talks about these there's a, these classes these minority classes there is a sense yeah. of it's equal but no longer equal but better mm. right so th these minority groups are actually better than you know the the majority of the groups yeah well, like, if, if well, in, so, in I, I'd say they're almost like they're testing the waters because they're seeing what can we get away with from how how much what can we convince these weak, guilt-stricken white people? What can we get them to do? Yeah, and that's not saying that every single person who is a minority is thinking that, but I would argue certainly the people in this crowd in this video you're talking about, um, from this this black Israelites group, that is probably the thinking that's going through their heads. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it it's like this noble savage theory. Like the the, the, the black Americans, they're they're actually uh, better off, even though they're sort of like yes, less civilized or mm. less civilized compared to the the white colonials. But yeah. like you know, not all colonialism is bad. Like you know, Belgium versus the British. You know how the the, the Belgians treated Angola. Uh, versus, you know, the Brits abolishing. Oh, of course. Uh, what is it like um, in India where they, the, the woman would throw themselves into the funeral pile uh, when their husbands died? You know, they, I think they banned that. So This is, now, we're, we're getting, it, we're getting in some, into some dicey territory, obviously, but there are, I would, I would certainly think there's a fair argument to be made that there is a, there are, po there are both positive things in regards to what happened with colonialism in the same vein that there are some egregious things that also happened. But this is, I, I look at colonialism in the light that this is, this is human nature on display. It's human's capacity for great good as well as great evil mm. as well at the same time. Um, so to throw out all of what we've achieved with colonialism, um, it, spreading advances in technology and medicine is one example that comes to mind. Spreading, spreading the ideas of the importance of the individual, um, individuality, that and and it's taken it has taken two hundred odd years to for us to get to this point, which is a continual process in 
in trying to resolve our broken human nature, the idea that all men are created equal, which is it's an it's a an American philosophy or more a Western philosophy that has been spread throughout the world to varying levels of success. Mm. But you can see that idea reach all the way to reach all the way across the ocean to Australia. Yeah. But today we can see that. Yeah. At the same token, you you acknowledge yes there we did have we did have slavery, but guess what? We got rid of it. Realized in the West, going, hang on. This institution is evil. We need to stop it. Yeah, and and it's not just, uh, I guess you know, white colonial or European colonialism, no. because you got you know we, we go back to the story of Andrew Hawkins and and yeah. his twenty six other guys going to Gambia. You got people from Jamaica, Barbados, Mali, Ivory Coast, and Sierra, Sierra yeah. Leone, because yeah. black people sold black people to Europeans. That's what he said. It's it, yeah, <laughs> out of his own mouth. It, it's a very important. It's a very important ish point that. Is, is often not discussed or ignored from the conversation altogether, is that you had cultures in, uh, cultures in Africa, tribes of people, who went, hey, uh, you white settlers want, well, not white settlers, sorry, you, um, you white people want slaves to sell overseas? Uh, we'll get you slaves, that's fine. We'll do that. Yeah, and you go to yeah, the that... enemy, enemy tribe and just, you know, make warfare. And yeah, you get rid of you get rid of your enemies, and you also get the plunder too. So uh... I, I I remember in school that I had to um, I was studying uh, Hernan Cortez from yeah. um, what is what was it um, the Aztecs the Aztecs yes it was the Aztecs that's right yes yeah. uh, Cortez was um was was Spanish and um he he came over to um South um South America he didn't bring a massive army of white Spanish people but he was able to. I, um, I'm a bit hazy on some of the some of the historical details, but it's been a while. He was able to topple the Aztec Empire with the help of all of the other tribes that were living in around the area that feared and hated the Aztecs because the Aztecs were practicing human sacrifice and taking all their people and sacrificing them to their gods. Mm-hmm. So they went, stuff that Aztecs, we're going to side with these other guys who, who have guns and who will help us get rid of you. Now, obviously, some of the things that Hernan Cortez himself, the things that he and his people did, also agree very incredibly egregious. But it, I think it's an important point that the institution of slavery is not exclusively a white thing or a white idea. It's a human idea yeah. that you can see repeated all throughout different human cultures that have not, that even cultures that don't have any contact with each other. And that, and that, I think, is an important part of the conversation arg- and, and argument here when we're trying to now resolve and come to some form of resolution after slavery has, for the most part, been resolved. Yeah. And obviously, slavery is still happening, especially in the third world. It's still a thing that happens. Yeah, sex but, trafficking or that kind of stuff. Yeah, but, but it's, not to the, it's, it's not to the rampant wide scale that it was 300 or 200, 300 years ago. So we're now at a point where it's, I'd say it's almost been eradicated throughout most of the world. Mm. But where do we, how do we reconcile this and how do we move forward and beyond this together as a unified people again? Yeah. Oh. Like how do we get to that point? Well, that might be uh, in, the, in a section that's going to come up. So, mm. um, so I came across a book referenced in uh, Douglas Murray's book called The Madness of Crowds and wanted to read it so it's called the sunflower on the possibilities of and limits of forgiveness by simon weinsethal so simon lived from 1908 to 2005 and was a holocaust survivor who went through the, the concentration camps in Janowska, krakow plas plazo um, so i'm already make, butchering these names but it's, it's all in the in um, eastern europe so gross rosen and mouth was in guzen so afterwards became a hunter uh, for fugitive Nazi war criminals to bring them back to trial. So in this, the book, The Sunflower, the story, he describes an encounter in a Lemberg concentration camp where a dying Nazi soldier named Karl is lying in a hospital bed and Karl recounts his involvement in the Holocaust and he asks Simon for forgiveness. So this encounter is documented and published and then what's happened is that um, there's two sides in this book, or there's two parts in this book. So part one is a story, and then part two is the responses to Simon on how he should have responded and if he was the right thing to do. 
So I'll go through uh, the book. I'll just go through some of the extracts from the book here. All right. So we'll we'll listen to uh, the first encounter of of Carl with the Jews. The context is Carl's Carl and uh, Simon are in hospital, and Carl's dying and is in a he's in bed. He's got bandages on his head, and Simon is holding his hand, and Carl is recounting some of the stories uh, from from the Holocaust. So, so Simon here says, I noticed that the dying man had a warm undertone in his voice as he spoke about the Jews. I had never heard such a tone in the voice of an SS man. Was he better than the others? Or did the voices of the SS men change when they were dying? An order was given, he continued, and we marched towards the huddled mass of Jews. There were 150 of them, or perhaps 200, including many children who stared at us with anxious eyes. A few were quietly crying. There were infants in their mother's arms, but hardly any young men, mostly women, and greybeards. As we approached, I could see the expression in their eyes. Fear? Indescribable fear. Apparently, they knew what was awaiting them. A truck arrived with cans of petrol, which we unloaded and took into the house. The strong men among the Jews were ordered to carry the cans to the upper stories. They obeyed apathetically, without a will of their own, like automatons. Then we began to drive the Jews into the house. A sergeant with a whip in his hand helped any of the Jews who were not quick enough. There were a hail of curses and kicks. The house was not very large. It had only three stories. I could not have believed it possible to crowd them all into it. But after a few minutes, there were no Jews left on the street. He was silent, and my heart began to beat violently. I could well imagine a scene. It was all too familiar. I might have been among those who were forced into the house with the petrol cans. I could feel how they must have pressed against each other. I could hear the frantic cries as they realized that that was to be done to them. The dying Nazi went on. Then another truck came up full of more Jews, and they too were crammed into the house with the others. Then the door was locked and a machine gun was posted opposite. I knew how the story would end. My own country had been occupied by the Germans for over a year, and we had heard of similar happenings in Bayerlostock, Brody, and Grodek. The method had always was always the same. He could spare me the rest of his gruesome account. So I stood up, ready to leave. But he pleaded with me, Please stay, I must tell you the rest. I really do not know what kept me, but there was something in his voice that prevented me from obeying my instinct to end the interview. Perhaps I wanted to hear from his own mouth, in his own words, the full horror of the Nazis and humanity. When we were told that everything was ready, we went back a few yards, then received the command to remove safety pins from hand grenades and throw them through the windows of the house. Detonations followed one after another. My God. Now he was silent, and he raised himself slightly from the bed. His whole body was shivering. But he continued, we heard screams and sort of flames eat their way from floor to floor. We had our rifles ready to shoot down anyone who tried to escape from that blazing hell. The screams from the house were horrible. Dense smoke poured out and choked us. His hand felt damp. He was so shattered by his recollection that he broke into sweat and loosened my hand from his grip. But at once he groped for it again and held it tight. Please, please, he stammered. Don't go away. I have more to say. I no longer had any doubts as to the ending. I saw that he was summoning his strength for one last effort to tell me the rest of his story to its bitter end. Behind the windows of the second floor, I saw a man with a small child in his arms. His clothes were alight, but at his side stood a woman, doubtless the mother of the child, with his free hand, the man covered the child's eye. Then he jumped into the street. Seconds later, the mother followed. Then from the other windows fell burning bodies. We shot. Oh God. The dying man held his hand in front of his bandaged eyes as he wanted to banish the picture from his mind. I don't know how many tried to jump out the windows, but at one family, I shall never forget, least of all the child. It had black hair and dark eyes. He fell silent, 
completely exhausted. So that was one of the, the first massacres that Carl did on the Jews and it was pretty horrible in terms of just shoving all the Jews into one house, setting on fire and then throwing grenades and then shooting any survivors. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, it was pretty brutal there. Um, and then for these, um, the SS, uh, there was another bit where they came to attack by, I, I guess the Russians. And then because you, you attack, you lose a few friends. Um, you, you get really angry. You want to revenge. Yeah. But instead of taking revenge on the resistance, the local, the local resistance members, the group vents it on a different, uh, group, which is the Jews again. Yeah. So he says, uh, so shortly afterwards, we moved on. On the way, we were told that the massacre of the Jews were, was in revenge for the Russian time bombs, which had cost us about 30 men. We had killed 300 Jews in exchange. Nobody asked what the murdered Jews had to do with the Russian time bombs. In the evening, there was a ration of brandy. Brandy helps one forget. Over the radio came reports from the front. The number of torpedoed ships of prisoners taken or planes shot down and the area of the new conquered, uh, newly conquered territories. It was getting dark. Uh, so fired by the brandy, we sat down and began to sing. I too sang. Today I asked myself how I could have done that. Perhaps I want to anesthetize myself. For a time I was successful. The events seemed to recede further and further away, but during the night they came back. A comrade who slept next to me was Peter, and he too came from Stuttgart. He was restless and asleep, tossing to and fro and muttering. I sat up and stared at him, but it was too dark to see his face, and I could only hear him saying, No, no, and I won't. In the morning I could see by the faces of some of my comrades that they too had a restless night, but nobody would talk about it. They avoided each other, and even our platoon leader noticed it. Yeah, so... It's not like these SS men were like robots because in here, after doing retaliation, like they also, you know, they had some intelligence to say, well, what does that got to do with what we've been attacked by? Right. And yeah. they tried to um, use substances like alcohol to uh, numb the pain. And then even then they got like some mental health issues. Yeah. With yeah. sleepless nights and nightmares yeah well that that's that is what we call guilt they're trying they're trying to assuage it to forget about it yeah to compare this story to the stories we were looking at before this is very very di there's a stark difference between the people feeling guilty the um the nazi soldiers are feeling guilty over something that they've done against another fellow human being mm -hmm. as opposed to an ans a descendant sorry a descendant of someone who has obviously done something horrible and horrendous against another human being we're talking about someone who is their uh, distant descendant yeah who is also who is who is, who is still battling with um, battling with this guilt yep but I think that the the appropriate response is very different or should be should be considered very different of what these two groups should be should be either expected of to do yeah and, yeah. and, and so I'll, I'll touch upon that but i'll probably outline what happens next which is yeah Ka carl is dying uh, he received a wound to his to his head which is why his head's all bandaged up right um and Simon is there because a he Carl asks a nurse to come to his room and he tells a story. And when he finishes the story, he asks Simon to forgive him based on the knowledge that Simon is a Jew. Simon right. was dragged from the prison camp. Uh, he was working and then the nurse notices him. So he has, in a way, he wasn't linked to that particular group, but he was part of that collective group as an identity. Uh, I see. No, I, I follow. Yeah. yeah. And then, so Carl asks Simon for forgiveness for what he has done. And Simon is 
sort of stunned. Yeah. And then he walks away, giving no response to Carl. Later on in the story, he le- Simon learns that Carl has passed away. And after the war, he go, he's disturbed by the story and he chases up the history and he goes to see Carl's mother. Right. And Carl, Carl's mother doesn't actually know much about Carl himself. Like he's under, she's under the impression that Carl was just a, a, a good Catholic boy. He was about to go to seminary, but then he was deceived by Nazis and then joined the, the military. Yeah. And so Carl's is talking to Simon, but under the impression that Carl was innocent and that he just died in battle. And here's a second time Simon, he actually does not reveal Carl's story that he was, he, that he heard from Carl. He doesn't yeah. tell that to Carl's mother and he just leaves without telling her the truth. Right. And this is the first part of the book where he actually asked the reader, what should I have done? Um, because it's, the bit here is there's a bit about whether he was right or wrong to give forgiveness and whether he was right or wrong uh, to tell the mother the truth like what should he be to, should to he break, have given to break to break the illusion that um that he was a good boy has been cre- that yeah that, that has been a point i would say unwittingly being created by his mother yeah um because i would suspect she didn't know, she didn't know any different mm. um, but does he i guess he, there's, there's a there's a moral struggle here because do you do you break the heart of someone does what is their value in or is there any good that can come from from breaking the heart of someone else, even if it is telling the cold hard truth, it's a question there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and but there were several reactions uh, in this book. You said, "Yep." So what I go through is I'll, I'll go through a select few. There's there's lots yeah. more, but I found these ones to be interesting. So so there's a first one called Jean Amory, and he's actually an atheist, and he reads the the story, and this is his response, or this is part of his response. So it goes, uh, so from Jean Amory. Dear Mr. Weinsendel, you will inevitably be disappointed by my comments. Your problem is not a problem for me. Let me explain. You did not give the dying SS man absolution from a Jew. If I had been in such a situation, perhaps I would have been more yielding. For your interests, interests against and my magnanimity, which is possible by no means certain, means nothing to me, or rather would mean nothing to me. As I see it, the issue of forgiving or not forgiving in such a case has only two aspects, a psychological one and a political one. Psych- psychologically, forgiving or not forgiving in this specific case is nothing more than a question of temperament or feeling. I do not want to impute any other possible behavior to you, but I can easily imagine that under any significantly different circumstances, you might have forgiven a dying man. Suppose you have seen the, his pleading, imploring eyes, which may have more of an effect on you than his rasping voice or folded hands. Or suppose that just before the encounter, you had been in contact with one of these decent SS men, who we all know who had treated you with a little bit more of kindness, putting you in a more tolerant mood. Or suppose you had learned that some Germans had helped a close relative to his escape. As you know better than I, such things really did happen. So then you might have forgiven. In my view, it would have meant just as little as your, or possibly my, refusal. So much for the psychological perspective. Now, the political. Here too, in such a dramatically critical but certainly unique case, and therefore without any general implications, forgiving or not forgiving is quite irrelevant. Whether you are agnostic or a believer, I do not know, but your problem belongs to the realm of guilt and atonement. So even if we cast it in an agnostic form, the problem is a theological one. Or as such, it does not exist for me, an atheist, who is indifferent to and rejecting of any metaphysics of morality. I think that this does not concern individual forgiveness or individual intransigence. One can say, your dying SS man took part in extermination. He knew very well what he was doing. He may, come to go, he may come to terms with his God, if he believes in one, and may just as well die unconsoled. One can say, one can also say, what difference does it make? Let him rest in peace. In the name of God, 
or of the devil, or if my forgiveness matters to him, I'll give it. Politically, it does not make any difference. So um, that was from from him, uh, from, from, from wow. Gina Marie. And he breaks it down, you know, there's two, there's two sides. And you know what, whether or not you, you forgive or not forgive, politically or psycho or um or as it psychologically it doesn't make any difference to me yeah i was like this it, is the it, most lackluster response yeah. it's very sophisticated but it's like i feel empty after that <laughs> it's full it's full of it's full of flowery words and fancy language um full it's, re, it's reeking of intellectualism of mm. i am i am smart um which it, it's in, it's it's funny because we're dealing with an issue obviously that is a moral one with the holocaust there is a there has been a great moral crime committed against the jews and the reason why we know that it is a crime we know that this is wrong is because of morality what gene amory here is saying is that he's, he's he's acknowledging that there is a there's what was done was wrong but then he rejects the entire notion of there being a moral code to begin with which it, well which i find I, I find quite quite humorous in some respects, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because well, I fi sorry, I find I find it humorous because it it doesn't leave you anywhere. It leaves you without a foundation to to exist in this world, really. Mm. We can't build a firm foundation on this to make decisions. I I don't see at least on how you can make decisions on how to operate within within life. Yeah. Well, in fact, Jean Marie is actually uh, one of the resistance fighters in Belgium. So he was actually c captured by the Gestapo and sent to uh, the concentration camps as well. So it's like right. you've had this sort of similar experience, and yeah, you, you're sort of. I guess he's acting logically by his own beliefs. Like if he really is an atheist and he doesn't really believe in any sort of consequence by you know or, or judgment, then yeah, it doesn't really matter to him. It's it's um it's pretty empty. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's another one, and it's by Matthew Fox, and I'll, I'll just quickly look at his uh his bio here. So Matthew Fox is a president of the New University of Creation and Spirituality in Oakland. Uh, he's author of several books, and he's also a Roman, Roman Catholic priest of the Dominican Order for 28 years, and he's also an Episcopal priest. It's not quite answering the questions, but I found it notice. Um, I've noticed one of his responses is that, um, so I'll read it here. So some kind of mysterious grace seemed to have passed between these two young men. Indeed, I wonder if Simon did not receive his vocation from this dying SS man. Why do I say that? Because in many ways, Weinsethal's life commitment uh, since surviving the death camp can be understood as a playing out of the scene so powerfully described as the at hospital bed. Simon has continued to hunt down Nazis in order one might believe, to allow them a deathbed confession. Without hunting these sinners down, neither they nor their victims will rest in their next life. Without this remembering, justice dies. Simon was just to the SS men, and more than just, he was compassionate, and his whole life commitment since has been a pursuit of justice and therefore of compassion. For there is no compassion without justice. Simon does not condemn the criminals he uncovers, he leaves that up to the judge at the courts. He only provides the witnesses, the testimony, the evidence. They convict themselves, as did Carl. As in this vocation to tell the truth, someone carries out a lesson that Carl left him. It is a strange exchange, a strange bond with these two young men. It is moving to behold. Simon gave Carl a listening ear on his deathbed, and Carl gave Simon a vocation for his life. So, in a sense, uh, this priest is observing that you know what what's playing out in the hospital bed is that he sees that the only way that uh, these Nazis will confess is at the point of death when they're faced with the reality and faced with the guilt yeah what's the takeaway from this story is that Simon goes on to become a Nazi hunter and this is him trying to bring justice and make these guys face their crimes they face the consequence of their actions yep yeah and, and then sort of repeat what Carl's doing by confessing and trying yeah. to atone for themselves, you know, trying to f ask for forgiveness or, or be judged for the, for the crime. So he's pretty bringing yeah. justice and he's also bringing confession from them. It was an interesting story. Uh, interesting also observation. 
I, I, I think the format of this book is quite compelling um, in that there's a there's a story, there's a scenario, there's you're being presented with a with a situation here, and then different perspectives and different backgrounds are being engaged and brought into the conversation to go, what is your response? And then the reader can look at these different responses and get a bigger picture of this uh, diversity of thought of how to respond. Mm. Yeah. All right. So I'll go, I'll go into the next one. It's an interesting one. It's called, uh, it's from Yosi Klein Hel- Helvi, <laughs> between his names. Uh, so he grew up in New York, the son of a Holocaust survivor. He made his home in Israel. Where he's a senior writer for the Jerusalem Report magazine. He has written memoirs of a Jewish extremist and autobiography. And uh, this is what he says. So, Weinzenol's encounter with a dying Karl occurs in a dimension beyond our understanding and judgment. Presuming the right to judge Weinzenol, the, the camp inmate, reveals a lack of humility. It risks repeating the mistakes of those who didn't experience the Holocaust but who readily condemned its survivors for not re- violently resisting, for supposedly collaborating, for remaining alive. The very fact that Weinzelow and his fellow prisoners debated the question of forgiving Carl is more than we have the right to expect of them. Uh, we are permitted to judge Weinzelow, the post-war survivor. By deciding to rejoin our world rather than enter a bitter seclusion, he and other survivors assume the burden of moral normalcy From 1945 onward, they would be measured by the same standards as the rest of us. Their wartime suffering couldn't serve as a refuge from the scrutiny of their post-war lives. In responding to Weinzelow's story, then I begin where I have the right to begin. With his encounter with Karl's mother in 1946, uh, here there is no moral ambiguity. Rather than tell her the truth about Karl, Weinzelow allows this woman who has lost everything to at least retain mother's pride in her son. He rejects his opportunity for vicarious vengeance among against the innocent. Whatever happened there cannot justify cruelty here. Refusal to forgive belongs to that time and place, not ours. So that simple message took me a long time to learn. Though born after the war, I was one of the Jews who tried to isolate Germany in a cordon of untouchability. I refused to visit Germany or buy German products. When I meet Germans my age, I related to them with blatant distaste, delighting in their discomfort. I wanted the Germans, all Germans who identified with that poison culture, to be exiled from humanity. Finally, I traveled to Germany in November 1989 as a journalist. The Berlin Wall had just been breached. In the frozen evenings, I joined a dense crowd moving in slow motion along the Kudam, West Berlin's main avenue, and was reminded to my dismay of Jerusalem in the weeks after the Six-Day War. The same day's joy, the same incredulous sense of crossing inviolate borders. To exclude myself from the German celebration, I felt was to deny myself an essential human experience, exiling myself from humanity. During the same trip, I visited a Protestant youth club in West Berlin, Mirbaum House, named for the German Jew killed in the Holocaust. A poster on the wall announced a trip to Poland to help clean the sites of former death camps. Other posters supported various liberal and fringe radical causes, from the anti-apartheid rallies to Amnesty International to the Sandinistas. One felt that the dead Jew Mirbaum was the dominant presence of this place, that the young people here were offering the notion of altruistic politics to his memory. So I asked these teenagers whether they felt any pride in being German. They laughed. Did they feel excitement when the wall fell? Blank stares. I thought of the enthusiasm with which Israelis their age reacted to a national triumph, the rescue of an endangered diaspora community, a successful attack against a terrorist leader, and it seemed to me that, as a people, we had emerged from the Holocaust with our life force more intact than had the Germans. The young people of Mirbaum House appeared so intimidated by the Holocaust that they couldn't allow themselves to share their people's celebration. But instead of taking a grim pleasure and a shame, I felt the emptiness of revenge against the guiltless. And I found myself actually urging them not to allow the past to distort the present. 
not to allow Auschwitz to deny them a moment of well-earned self-respect. Certainly, I don't believe that, the, that Germans or Jews should obscure the memory of the past. But since that encounter in Berlin, I have become increasingly committed to German-Jewish reconciliation. Weinzendorf's humane gesture towards Karl's mother to reinforces for me the sense that just as we are commanded to remember all our Egypts, there are times where we must also transcend them. For Weinzendorf, the survivor behaving graciously towards the mother of an SS officer required moral courage for the rest of us. Treating a new generation with decency requires also moral common sense. You know, he had hatred towards the Germans for what they've done yeah. from the Holocaust. And for the Israelis, they, you know, after the Six Day War, they had this massive celebration. But for the Germans, when they, when the, the Berlin Wall fell, they were quiet. They were mm. apathetic. They were, I guess, in one sense, haunted by the Holocaust that they couldn't celebrate any noteworthy news at all like, i think i think there's also some a further element to that is that they as a people had been subjugated by the russians and they and they'd been held held um was it east berlin was that was that the russian side yeah yeah in in east berlin they had been held or oh, actually hold, hold on are we talking about the the western side so the the, te the teenage group the teenage group is based in west berlin Okay, fair, no, fair enough. Sorry. Um, yeah, it just it just occurred to me as I was I was talking, thinking about East and West, going which which group of Germans are we talking about? Then no, in that case, you it it raises it raises a really interesting point of contrast then between the Israeli response and and the German response as a, as a group of people. What at this at what guilt has done to them as people? Yeah, like they're they're numb with guilt so yeah. for so long because they've been told, you know, you guys are Germans are bad people. Yeah. You've started, you know, two world wars, you've also killed lots of Jews, that mm. when there's a time when they're freed from communism and uh, there's actually time to unify West and East Berlin after yeah, what, forty years or so? Um yeah. that they can't celebrate. They're just like no. they're just blank when they're when this, uh, this Israeli guy asked them, how do you feel about it? And they're like, don't know. <laughs> uh, they've, 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 they've lost the fight. They've, they've lost the will to to continue to fight. Yeah. I, I, I would probably describe it as being a broken people. Mm. And, I, and I, think we're, I think that that's a demonstration of what happens when guilt destroys you. Where, and it, it paralyzes. It's, it, I, could, I, I would describe it as almost paralyzed. Paraly as a paralyzation. Yeah. But not on an individual level, but this is on a on a national level, yeah. on a culture of people, and you can see the result of this of this paralysis. The next part is uh, Jose Hobde, and uh, Jose is Hobde is a Franciscan nun of Seneca, Iroquois, and Seminole descent. Her writing on Catholic and Native American spirituality, as well as Native American affairs, has appeared in many publications, including Parabola, Cross Currents, The National Catholic Reporter, and Praying Magazine, where she has been a columnist for 10 years. She lectures nationally and internationally, and has recorded over a dozen cassettes. So her essay, and it's a very short one, would be, The question, what would I have done, seems to imply that my response might be a judgment on Mr. Weinsiedel's action. I make no such judgment. Altruism, mental gymnastics, conundrums, theologizing, and debates could swirl around this question. To me, these are not integral. For some, forgiveness is a weakness. It may actually be a condoning of the evil done. I do not agree. In the air is also the question, does Carl even have the right to ask forgiveness? That is beside the point, because he does ask. Mr. Weinsdorf tells us that he stays with a dying man, listens to his story, but does not want to give comfort to him. Mr. Weinsdorf leaves in silence. A silence that will, that will have a different meaning for each man. I am of Native American descent, Seneca, Iroquois, and Seminole, and have felt discrimination all my life in, on this land. I have listened to the stories and read of atrocities, executions, starvation, and genocide committed against my people. History gives us many accounts of these afflictions, Native people have been wiped out by government gifts of smallpox, blankets, 
we have dogs set upon us and have been shut down for sport. Many more than 6 million of us. This too has been going on for centuries, while the invaders and conquerors have stood by and watched. Many others around the world have suffered terrible indignities as well. But the words of my Seneca mother to me when I was badly wronged and wanted revenge and retaliation stay with me. Do not be so ignorant and stupid and inhuman as they are. Go to an elder and ask for the medicine that will turn your heart from bitterness to sweetness. You must learn the wisdom of how to let go of poison. Forgetting and forgiveness may seem to be two different things, but I believe they are of a piece. Every time you, re you remember a wrong, you ask to forgive it. From my experience, wrongs will return to the minds for years and years and years. Each recall asks for forgiveness, and you stay in the power of the act until you let go. Compassion is all-embracing, extending to all creation, to plants and to animals, including the two-legged variety. Forgiveness is of the heart. I would have forgiven as for my own peace as for Carl's. Mr. Weinstein has gained a sure knowledge that he should follow the path of doing good and seeking justice. My hope is that he finds peace and harmony in his heart, and if the memory is still a burden to him, that it be wiped away. No one, no memory should have the power to hold us down, to deny us peace. Forgiving is the real power. I offer him the sturdy sunflower of our great West. It is small enough to dance. Ho. Oh. So this is a Native American um, from, I guess, uh, you, you, you've heard the story that they've been, you know, pushed in this corner. They've been discriminated. They had the, the blankets. Yeah. Smallpox. They were a nomadic group. They traveled all across the land, but now they're being told, you stay here. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, um, it was called the, the, the Trail of Tears, I think, in the US, where the, the where you had um, the army forcing indigenous um, indigenous groups, uh, Native Americans, to um, towards these reservations. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, a lot. This, this is an example of a lot of evil has been done from a government point of view. Mm-hmm. And you're then having to deal with the ramifications of that generations down the road going, okay, how do we, we aren't doing this anymore, but how can we move on from here? How can we, how can we continue to go? Yeah. Well, how, how, not continue to go, how can we, um, how can we come back together again and reconcile and move forward as, a, as one people? But, but what she's saying here is if like from, from a victim's perspective, mm. is that you let go of the poison. If, like, if you hold on to it, it'll keep poisoning you yeah and you know why should you let them you know infect your memory and and chain you down to the past absolutely so to let yourself go to be better than them you forgive them and you move on because you you take the higher ground so yeah it, it's it's in one sense you know whether to forgive or not forgive it from uh the the offender look at look at it from the victim's point of view and just say you know what I want to be free from this um, terrible crime. I'm going to move on to show I'm stronger than you and to show that I am strong. I'm going to forgive you and not let this terrible crime define me. going to have to end it there folks as part one of the sunflower and learning about forgiveness i certainly learned a lot producing this episode we live in a world where historical grievances can drag down a next generation of people down by the chains of their guilt we live in an increasingly secularized world and has thrown off the shackles of its heritage as the western world loses its heritage in its christian origins and belief so too are loss the etiquettes and conducts of how we resolve transgressions and today we struggle to learn how to reconcile not just wrongdoings we've done, but what our ancestors done long ago. It leads to the question, how do we forgive each other? Is it right to forgive? And who should be doing the forgiving? Stay tuned for episode two of the Sunflower Forgiveness.
If you'd like to support our mission to produce quality podcasts like this, please share and subscribe and place a link on your social media. Every bit of support counts. If you want to reach us, you can email us at thefireinadesert at gmail.com or use Twitter at Fire in the Desert. Music is Outfoxing a Fox by Kevin McLeod at incontech.com. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you.